I just want to say thank you for having me here today. It is a pleasure and an honor to serve with you today. And we will get to our scripture lesson. It's a, a short one taken from the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 25, verses 11 through 12. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver, like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. You may have heard this story or something similar to it of the man that worked for a company. His name was George. And at work sometimes they would get together and go out afterwards and socialize together, have a couple of drinks. And George seldom did this, but he decided they were celebrating a big goal that they had reached. And so he decided, yeah, he was gonna go and do it. And so he told his wife and she was fine with that. Well, he went and they were having a great time. There was lots of laughter, regaling stories of the workplace, stories of outside the workplace. And let's just say the alcohol was flowing freely. And before he knew it, several hours had passed and it was late before he got the thought that it was probably time to go home. Well, he was rather affected and so he headed home and the next thing he remembers, he wakes up and he turns and he looks to the left side and his wife is not there and he turns and looks to the right side and there's a note on his nightstand. Well, after last night, he's kind of dreading looking at it, but he decided, well, I better go on and read it. And so with trepidation, he opens it up and it says, my darling husband, I hope you are feeling all right. In case you aren't, there are two aspirin and a glass of water in the master bath by the sink. There is a full breakfast for you down in the oven. It's warm. There's eggs, bacon, hash browns, biscuits and gravy, a fresh pot of coffee and orange juice in the refrigerator. I'm running some errands. I'll be back. I'm getting the supplies to fix your favorite meal for you tonight. Well, he's really confused. This isn't what he's expecting at all. So he gets up and he goes in and he's taking the aspirin and he looks in the mirror. Well, he has a big black eye. And he is like, boy, I really don't remember what happened last night. And so he said, something is up. So he heads downstairs. His teenage son is sitting at the table. And he said, son, I, you know, I hate to admit this, but let this be a lesson. I drank a little bit too much last night and I'm just not remembering what happened. And the son said, well, I can fill in all the blanks. You came in and you were fall down drunk. In fact, you fell down and hit your head on the table and that's how you got the black eye. And he goes, so mom said, we've got to get him up and get him to bed. And so we got you upstairs and as she was trying to get you undressed and ready for bed, you kept saying, leave me alone, woman. I'm a happily married man. So fitting words, he said, to make his situation a lot better. <laughs> Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom. And it's attributed to Solomon, mainly. There are a couple other contributors, but most of it goes attributed to Solomon, said to be the wisest man to have ever lived. And when you read Proverbs, it's different than the other books of the Bible that you read. Usually they're tied to a character, they're tied to a location. But Proverbs is just short, wise sayings. So you feel like you're just reading little quips. But its goal is to teach us wisdom, to teach us discipline, how to live and be fair, and how to be just. And it's done through the repetition of these short, wise sayings. If you'll read, you'll see them word it different ways. So throughout this message, I'll be referring to quotes quite often to show you where they come from, and that we'll see the repetition. It covers a wide range of topics, but it speaks to all people, young people, old people, and talks to leaders, talks about wealth, about our words, about humility, how we should be living a godly life and using God's word to help us achieve it. We can have knowledge, which is knowing the facts, 
but if we don't have wisdom, the knowledge may not serve any purpose. For you can have knowledge, but if you don't have the wisdom to apply that knowledge, you fall short. And we have to remember, God doesn't want us to be fools. You'll, you'll see references in Proverbs to fools and folly. He wants us to be wise. And so he calls us to look at wisdom. And I'm going to read to you from the call of wisdom, which is in chapter 8, or chapter 6. And it's verses 6 through 11. And, and wisdom is portrayed as a woman who is guiding us. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. And we talk about the repetition. If you go to chapter 16, verse 16, it says, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. Today, we're going to look at the words that we speak and also how we listen. But it's on the wisdom of our words and what we hear. If we take a look at that first verse, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. When I would read about this, some of them would say, it's referring to it being your words are a thing of beauty. It would be beautiful silver basket holding beautiful golden apples. Or they would talk about engravings on the temples, that they were a thing of beauty. And that they are. Our words can be beautiful. They can be music to our heart to our ears, to our spirit. But we also have to look at the value of them. And this is comparing it and look at the value of the words we speak as being more than anything of any worldly good, the value that this worldly good may possess. <clears throat> if we look at how we talk, we can see what kind of person we truly are. It shows our attitudes towards others, and it's said to be reflective of what's in our heart. Think of what Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says. We've all heard this on the, at some point. A good man brings good things out of good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What we say is what is really in our heart. We can disguise the words and make them look pretty, but it's what's really in our heart that is behind the words we speak. Our speech can attest to how much wisdom we have. We have to use self-control. We have to be honest. We have to choose our words wisely because our words can affect people far more than our actions. We've all heard the old adages, actions speak louder than words, or the children's saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. But is that true? I don't think it's true. Look at people who decades later can recite words said to them that evidently cut them to their very core, and they can repeat them verbatim. And so you know how that has stuck with them. We've all had people that maybe we can relate to. So today, as far as our words, I was going to look at four types of tongues or speech patterns that we can fall into. Two of them we want to embrace, and two we want to avoid. And I'll start with the ones to avoid, and the first one would be the conniving tongue. And when I talk about these, I'll give a, a verse from, the, from Proverbs to do it. Like a coating of silver dross on earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Though their speech is charming, do not believe them, 
for seven abominations fill their hearts. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. This type of speech is centered around the wrong motives. It may be gossip, slander, or you could be someone twisting the truth to get what they want. I think we've all known, or we've all been guilty of, I probably have, I know I have, haven't we all at one time or another said something to someone and we say it with the intention of underhandedly giving a little jab to them. Maybe we think they've done us wrong, they've hurt us. You're not doing it overtly, it's something kind of innocent looking maybe, but it gives us some type of satisfaction that maybe we've made a point to them. And what's the in intent of our heart when we do that? It's not for good. It's to get them back. We can also twist the truth, put more blame on someone in situations than maybe is due them or what they deserve. But we do it maybe to save ourselves from looking bad or taking on more blame than we think we deserve when really we do. We can twist the truth to make it fit our motives and not what is actual honest truth. Slander and gossip kind of talk for themselves. I think we understand those. And gossip is easy to explain away. We can ask someone about a friend and our intentions are purely good. But we can, exp we can explain it away if we take a turn and we look at the true intent of our heart. Sometimes people will focus more on the negative and spreading negative words about the situation than they are on the good of the people. So look at our heart and what it is. I had to laugh because the Southerners have a way of doing, I was reading something, and the Southerners have a way of doing, they will give you a compliment and you go, is it really a compliment? Is it not? You'll hear them say, well, God love them, or bless your heart, or I'll pray for you. And you think, well, that's what they say when they don't really want to say anything negative. And some say, you have to watch for those because they're thin-veiled insults sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes but it's what lies in our heart that speaks the volume behind our words. The second would be the careless tongue, and this is the one I am most guilty of. And Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And Proverbs 15, 4 says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Now this is the person who does not think before they speak. And it is often quick-tempered, it's impatient, it's given to lies potentially, and it may be laced with some profanity, but it can result in rebellion and destruction. We live in a world that has changed since many of us were young. Social media is a whole new thing. Our values and our expectations have changed dramatically from what they were when I was a child. And I'll just get into the written word a little bit on the social media, and I think, you know, we have one of our own senators, Josh Hawley, who is advocating about the youth, or the health, mental health of our young women when they're seeing such an increase in depression of these young girls and they attribute it to social media. And all I would say about the social media is that in the written word, they can't tell your tone, they can't see your expression, all they can see are your words. And so it's however they interpret them that they will make their decisions. <clears throat> on the not thinking before speaking. A lot of times we get frustrated, something doesn't go, and I know this is, this is true of me, so I'm gonna talk about me. 
<laughs> uh, something doesn't go my way, I've had a bad day, things are going, and something will just lash out and I will get mad. And I'll, I'll say things, and may not even be directed at the person I'm with. Maybe that doesn't have anything to do with them, but unfortunately, let's look at the people that we generally affect most, and it's the people that we love the most. Those are the people that we will get angry in front of, or lash out in front of. They're the ones that bear the repercussions of our frustrations. It's merely that they're there at that moment. In public, something could happen. You can be in a, in a store, but you'll hold your tongue because you know you have to behave in public and not say something. But you get home with a loved one, and you'll say whatever is on your mind and your heart at that moment. And many times, they take it to heart as an insult to them. So we have to look at the words that we say. If you're like me, then hours later, not at the very moment, I'll be racked with guilt. And I'll think the ones who receive it most are my mother, my husband, and sometimes my brother. Then I'll go home and I'll think, oh, my brother who passed before me and my father have to be looking down and so disappointed in my behavior that I lashed out and that someone I love has taken it harsh. I should be more concerned too with the another disappointment of who I disappoint most and that's God. But I've started trying to apologize when I make these words, when I say use these words, and I say, I'm sorry, but it's easy to explain away. Oh, I've had a bad day, well this has gone on but I have to realize that I have to make an effort to look and use silence at times. You may have heard of the story of the, how they teach children a lesson or a church counselor once said that one of the girls at church camp, they had gone to a gathering and they came back and one of the little girls was very upset by something that was said to her and the counselor told one of the girls, go and get a tube of toothpaste. And so she did, and she told her, okay, squirt out all the toothpaste. And so she did. And she gets another girl and said, okay, now you get the toothpaste and put it back in the toothpaste tube. Well, we all know that's to no avail. It isn't going to work. But that's, she said, is like the words we speak. Once they're out, they can't be taken back. So... Let us listen to the words we say. Because they could be stones that could cause pain, or they can be a gift that lifts someone's up. Now, there are two we should try to go towards, and that's the control tongue. This is the person who actually thinks before they speak. <laughs> and it, Proverbs 16.23 says, The hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent and their lips promote instruction. And chapter 17, it says, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and discerning if they hold their tongues. This is the people who, as I say, hold their tongue, they, they think before they speak, and they look at their advice and say, is it wise, is it sound? Perhaps you have a friend who's telling you of a problem that they're encountering. And do you feel the need that you have to give advice? Oh, I better say something. Or do you sit and be silent and reflect? Sometimes that's all they want. They want your support. Someone to listen to them. Someone that's not passing judgment on them at that time. But silence can be awkward for us. If you're ever in a conversation and there's a lull, you'll sit there and think, oh boy, should I be saying something? Are they gonna say something? What do I say? And we had an executive at work that used this tactic in order to get information. He would come and he would come to your desk and he'd say, look, 
tell me about this and uh, what this error means, and you'd explain, but then he would stand there and stare at you. And so you'd get very, well, oh, should I be? So you'd start talking and you'd give more information. And I made the comment to someone once, I said, boy, I just hate it when he comes by because you just, you sit there, it's very, it's very uncomfortable. And they said that's how he gets his information because he's determined that he can get more information from his employees by using silence than he can by asking them. But maybe it's time we look at it and think it's silence. In order to connect with the Holy Spirit, don't we have to be silent? We have to be silent and listen. And our words like this can be like that. For us to really feel and know, we need to connect and we need to take silence into account, listen before we speak, and offer our advice. Finally, there's the caring tongue. And in Proverbs 16, 24, it says, Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. This is where we speak truthfully all the while seeking to encourage and lift up others. I was reading a while back on mentoring. I hadn't read much about mentoring or seen anything much mentoring. I didn't even know if they did it as much. You don't, I don't hear as much about it. But many of the great leaders that we have act as mentors or have been mentored by other leaders. You have Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Cuban, the big names. But this story was about four mentors who were average companies. I hadn't even heard of them. But what they learned from their experience, they learned as much as the mentee did. And they said, you have to be willing to say, I don't know if they ask you something and you truthfully don't know it. Show them that you don't know. Be truthful, be honest, and use it as a chance to grow. And also they said, you have to sit and listen to the person you are mentoring. For they said, every person we have mentored, we as leaders have learned from. They don't use it and think of it as, this is me telling the person what to do and how to do it. But they use it as an experience where they say, we can both grow from the words we use and from listening. If you look at the words of the Apostle Paul, the New Testament affirms this. In Ephesians, he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We also see Jesus, now these aren't necessarily the words like that, but the importance of our words in Matthew says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for the empty words they have spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. We see in that passage in Matthew, the same words that we saw in Luke, which is that our heart is what reflects our words and the importance of them. So let our words be words of life and love let them be thoughtful words. Let them be gentle words, acceptable words, caring words, understanding words, and words of truth. Finally, we have the second, and I'll touch on this briefly, the second verse of our scripture, which now I've closed it. Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. What this says to us is that when giving advice, we have to have a willing ear to that advice, an obedient ear. Giving advice to a person unwilling to hear it can result in rebellion, 
a feeling of betrayal, you have to be careful and really listen to what that person is saying for the advice that we give. If we take a look back at the words of David in Psalms 141 verses 3 and 5, he says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips, and let a righteous man strike me, that is a kindness, let him rebuke me, that is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it, for my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. We see that verse 3 relates to the words that we speak and what we had in our first verse of our scripture lesson. But in the fifth verse, what we see is David is saying to be rebuked by a godly person is a kindness. Now, if we get rebuked, we think of, we call it constructive criticism, and it has a negative connotation. We don't take it so, so well sometimes. But he is saying that it can offer us so much, and to be offered that rebuke can give us much more, a much more, uh, not destructive, we can be more proactive about it. Um, <clears throat> he said, well, when the Bible refers to it as a correction at some point, but if we take the wisdom that's offered to us humbly and accept it, we're going to benefit from it. So don't refuse when we're being corrected. Don't refuse the correction. Consider it a kindness and keep quiet, for it may be more productive than it is destructive. And at the heart of this is our ability to listen and to discern. Do we really hear what's being said to us or do we put our own spin on it and take it as we interpret it? It's said that Ernest Hemingway once said that most people never listen. And in fact, there's a story that he decided he was going to prove it and when he was with a gathering, when they would greet him, he would say, I killed my mad grandmother this morning. And everyone re except one person responded with words of, well, you are so wonderful. You do have such wonderful work. How much we enjoy you. No one responded to what he said except one person, and that person said, well, she probably did something to deserve it. <laughs> Is that true of us? Are we really listening? Roy Bennett has said that we don't listen to understand. Instead, we listen to reply. If we listen with curiosity, we don't listen to merely reply. We listen for what is behind the words. And that's the difference between hearing and listening. We can hear the words, but they don't register. But do we really listen and see what it went? And I will just close with saying that on this subject, uh, I came to speak to the women's group in March, and I talked about the three Marys that were present uh, when Jesus was crucified and were part of his life and the importance, and one of them was Mary of Bethany. Now, I have to admit that I learned the story of Mary and Martha when I was young in Sunday school. And really what I learned was Jesus came to visit Mary and Martha, one of them was concerned with how the house looked and getting the food on the table, and the other sat at Jesus' feet and did nothing. One was right and one was wrong. And Jesus told the one who was wrong that she was wrong. But then, when I was reading that passage, and I've read it a lot, I wouldn't say hundreds of times, but I've read it a lot, and you've heard it. But when I read it, I thought, that's not the way it is at all. You know, there's even shirts. I even have a shirt that said, be a Mary in a Martha world. Or, don't be a, don't be a Martha. There's quizzes you can take. Are you a Mary? Are you a Martha? And if you score low and you're a Martha, they've got advice for you. But when you read it, yes, he came to visit, and she goes to Jesus and said, Martha goes to Jesus because she's worried as she's, she's concerned with the hospitality. She's got to take care of Jesus and the disciples. There's at least 13 people there in the house. 
and she goes and said, don't you care? My sister is doing nothing to help. But look at Jesus' response. It wasn't telling her you were wrong. Instead, he said, Mary, Martha, not Mary, Martha, I know you are consumed with many things and you have many things on your mind. So he acknowledges that he knows how she feels. And he doesn't say you're doing what is wrong, but he said, truly there is very little that is needed. A gentle correction to her. This is what is needed, very little. You don't need to fix a big meal and have this. And he says, I will not take away what Mary is doing. And that's what we need to do when we correct. We acknowledge, he listened, he understood, and he treated her with gentleness and pointed her in the right direction. That be concerned with me feeding your spirit instead of you feeding our soul, our bellies, physically. So, giving advice or receiving it, the key is how we listen. So today, I'm gonna to take a look at the words I use and how fitting my words are, the wisdom of any advice I would offer, and whether I truly listen to others and I hear what is really being said, may I see the value of my words and my actions, knowing that their worth is far more valuable than any worldly good. Won't you join me in taking a look and reflecting on these things with me this week? Amen.